Okay, good. We've got a lot to cover here. The goal of this presentation is battery monitoring 101. So, uh, you know, I see quite a few out here who uh, already know this. So maybe you want to come up and help me explain it. For those of you who don't know the basics, um, I apologize. You know, I've got 52 slides and 45 minutes. And so that means it'd be kind of a, a, kind of a brief uh, battery monitoring 101. Okay, so uh, the basic concepts. We have two sections in this presentation. Um, as soon as I can find the button. Se section one will be the basic concepts, overall battery monitoring. And in section two, we'll sort of drill down into fuel gauging. So what does a battery monitor actually do? Well, a big part of it is estimating battery capacity. Uh, and that's the most difficult job. A couple of principles there will cover voltage lookup and current integration. Uh, we'll talk about the factors that affect just how difficult it is to, to do that. And then we'll cover briefly the other functions of a battery monitor. Safety and protection, the most important thing. Right? Cell balancing, charging support, communication and display, logging. There's, there's another function too, uh, and that's validation where the host asks the battery, are you really the right battery for this system? And, and there's a sort of a user ID password back and forth, but we won't talk about that today. All right, so here's the basic setup. Usually the battery monitor, or sometimes called fuel gauge, or gas gauge, uh, or BMS at some companies. It's a, it's a microcontroller. Uh, with some software that's arranged to make it a complete data acquisition and control system at a very reasonable price. It usually lives inside the battery pack with the batteries. So its inputs are the temperature, the, the current, the voltage of the batteries. And outputs are protection FETs, uh, maybe a chemical fuse and some communication uh, back to the host, where it might tell the host certain things that would get, get the host to turn the charger on and off and to take other action. So again, we've got capacity estimation, safety, charging support, communication and display, logging, and authentication is the functions we want to perform here. We're not talking about charging today. All right, so again, estimating fuel capacity. This, this is the hard part of this whole job, and it's almost smoke and mirrors in some use cases. I mean, if you don't know what the load of your system is going to be, it's really, really difficult to know the remaining capacity. I mean, just, just think of your, of, your, of your car. You know exactly how much fuel you've got in there in gallons, but well, you know, what, what speed are you going to be traveling at? What's the wind resistance? What's, uh, what's the acceleration? What's uh, so, you know, five or six different factors affect, affect how far you can actually go. So, in, o in order to get battery capacity estimated, we need a couple of things. Uh, we need a measurement system, voltage, current, or both. And we need a model. We need some sort of a model to take those measurement inputs and then produce the, uh, the output, which is time to empty, or how much, how much uh, charge you have left. Uh, regarding voltage lookup, you can think of it kind of like a glass of water that's being filled with a real powerful source, and it's splashing around in there. And if you could sort of look at the water while it's splashing around, you're not really sure how full the glass is. But as soon as the glass the water is allowed to settle, then you can take a peek at the level there and know exactly how much water you have. And it's the same with batteries. If you just let them settle, relax, no load, for a while, then you can simply measure the voltage and know the state of charge. It's not like a capacitor, however, where it's a linear relationship. It's really nonlinear, and so our glass model you know, is really more like a martini glass here, where you've got the, 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 the half-drunk uh, battery just falling off the cliff here all of a sudden. 
So this is the OCV voltage table, or DOD representation. We, you saw your first one back here. You notice this one is arranged coming down from left, to, from right to left. You'll see them that way, and you'll see them most of the time like this, where we start with a full charge on the left, and the curve comes down towards the right. Fully charged, discharging, discharging, and then suddenly we fall off the cliff as we get near the end of the discharge. A couple characteristics uh, of this curve you, you, you want to know is that there's a, a region in here that is relatively flat and there's, n there's no slope to it. Well, that makes it really difficult to correlate voltage and state of charge. So we normally will we'll take a look at these curves and say, aha, this is where it starts to get flat, this is where it stops getting flat, and we call that V min and V max that define the, the flat zone. That's a region where we don't like to use voltage to correlate with state of charge, even if we're relaxed. Can do it for most cells, but the, because of that slope, you need a very, very accurate voltmeter. Okay, the other major way to, uh, to do this is with current integration, right? Current is a rate, so it's a derivative, and all we have to do is integrate that and we can get back to the number of electrons in the cell. This works really well uh, for situations where you discharge almost down to the end once in a while. And the hardware you use to do it is uh, what we call a Coulomb counter. Uh, the sense resistor um, is feeding into a some sort of an A to D with a, with a very low, low offset, low drift circuit, high gain circuit. Okay. In terms of the models that we need to convert these measurements into, into the result we want, we normally think of the battery as a voltage source with a resistor in series for the DC model. And then for the AC model, it's really two or three resistors in series, and those other two have caps across them. So you can see that if we have an open circuit, caps are discharged, you can kind of disregard those other two resistances. But as you start drawing current from the battery, you have a couple of, of uh, RC time constants there to deal with, and the impedance starts to go up. So you can have a model and understand it very well and use that to convert your measurements into the state of charge result. Or maybe just use a table lookup. You could have a large multi-dimensional table where you have current, voltage, temperature, aging, all of that corresponding to, to a state of charge. But think about how long it would take you to figure all that out. It's going to be maybe months in the lab. Um, and, you know, and then does it really work? Um, one problem with batteries is the, the impedance is not stable even within one lot of batteries. That can be up to 15% difference. The advantage, though, is you don't have to have a cell model. Okay? And you can apply linear interpolation to these tables and make, make it look continuous. Uh, it is very memory intensive, however. It's also difficult to do this because you've got all kinds of sources of error. PCB component problems, uh, instrumentation accuracy, is your model accurate? What about aging? Do you, do you know what these cells are going to be like five years out? And all of these fact, all of this chemistry, the impedance especially, is really, really unstable with respect to temperature. So for example, if you're going to do a Coulomb counter gauge, how are you going to do it? Are you going to take a A to D converter on your microcontroller uh, and try to measure this, uh, you know, what might be a few tens of millivolts or even one millivolt dropped across your sense resistor? You're going to have to get an op amp with a very low, bio, uh, very low offset, very low drift. Um, electrically, it's not that easy to do. 
You've got to worry about ADC resolution, uh, how many steps you've got there, uh, sampling rate. Are you really sampling fast enough to capture the, the waveform that you need to capture to be able to integrate it? You know, what about voltage drift, um, calibration, noise immunity? If the drift, if the, if the gain is drifting, uh, you don't have much to work with. Uh, all kinds of noise issues can come to play. You want to make sure that you can accurately integrate this current, even if the waveform looks something like that. Getting the model accurate is not easy. You've got steady state to worry about, transient degradation, and <laughs> something we call modeling. Uh, it's not easy. You can use various techniques to build a model. You know, I see people in this room who have, who have done this, done it successfully. It's not a simple thing. Temperature. Temperature measurement is always part of a, ba a battery monitoring system, any ba battery monitoring system. It's really, really important for capacity estimation, safety. Uh, a cell that's running away in, in temperature is not, not a safe cell. Charging control, we have a new standards from Japan called JADA, where charging voltage and current are based on the temperature. Temperature impacts all these parameters, the resistance especially, but also the capacitance, the open circuit voltage, and the max capacity. Okay, let's switch gears and look at safety. It was, uh, I think, the summer of 2005 where we had the summer of the exploding notebooks. Just Google that or on YouTube and you can see a video of uh, the notebooks just sitting in a conference room and all of a sudden going up in flames. The lithium is dangerous. I think it's, what, one quarter the explosive power of TNT. Uh, there isn't much of it in there, but still can, can be a very nasty situation if, if you let these cells get out of control. Some of these newer cells are much, much better. For example, the lithium iron phosphate thermal runaway is double that of the lithium cobalt, way up, way up at 350 degrees. Cells are generally safe, though. Um, the ones, that, the ones that had that incident in 2005 were actually a machine made by a very reputable company, but they had a process issue where tiny little microparticles of metal were in there and working their way in. But the cells are safe. They have many, many, well, several different types of safety uh, mechanisms, pressure relief, PTCs, the steel case itself. Uh, the separator, that separator actually you know, has this, is sort of like a real fine mesh screen. And if it gets too hot, well, it just melts and stops the flow. But you gotta remember, a lot of these are made by people with $200 a month, very good, decent $200 a month jobs in China, and they're rolling them by hand. So there's still the, the possibility that uh, something, could, something could happen. Okay, electrically, how do we do safety? Um, it's basically, we have, we have many, many different aspects to this, but we want to protect against short circuit, over and under. When we say under current, we mean high discharge current. So high currents, over and under voltage, over temperature, FET failure, fuse failure, communication failure, locked up, microprocessor, flash failure, ESD, and cell imbalance. For the overcurrent especially, you can think of this as a whole series of programmable circuit breakers. They're programmable in both time and in current. So for example, this chart shows different levels of current over here and a corresponding time for each colored line. For example, here's a small current but if it lasts this long, then we're going to turn off the FETs. Here's a huge current, but if it lasts only this long, microseconds compared to seconds, 
we're going to turn off the feds. It's interesting that this middle one, where this middle level current lasts for a mid-level time, that's the one that is lethal. That's the one that's going to blow the chemical fuse. But you can set these up any way you want. Again, there's programmable current and programmable time for each of these in a typical battery monitor. Now the hardware of a battery monitor is typically two or three ICs, usually three chips, but two of the chips are often packaged in one IC. So you have the fuel gauge itself, or battery monitor, which is a low, ultra-low current microcontroller with some sophisticated A to D converters on it. You have the AFE, the analog front end, which has a few functions in there, several functions. One would be to lower the voltage of the cells before presenting them to the A to D converter. Another would be looking at the, at the current and having hardware uh, method to turn these FETs off in microseconds. Also has an LDO to power the microcontroller. And then there's usually another device, a second safety OVPIC, such as the 29412. And this is something relatively new in safety. It's the Japan Electronic Industry uh, Trade Association, JADA, where they have found that batteries are safer if you reduce both voltage and current when you're cold, and then again, when you're hot. As long as you're in this safe region, which is typically between 10 and 45 degrees, then you can go ahead and use full voltage, full current. Now that was only applicable in Japan, but um, I've heard that, that China may be adopting this, this policy also. Okay, how do we collect temperature information? You really want to be sure that you've got the worst case, um, the hottest cell, or maybe use several thermistors at different places on your array of cells. And the other problem with heat is what we call heat imbalance. And this is a thermal image of a, of a typical battery pack where the cells are you know, not uh, isothermal, and that causes de degradation in some cells faster than in others, and therefore they start to become unbalanced. And unbalancing is not a good thing. Uh, it reduces your your ability to get to get all the energy you want out of the out of the pack, and could be a safety issue. So, what can we do about it? Well, in the typical battery monitor, we have some kind of cell balancing function, okay? Here's the BQ3060, for example. For every cell, it has a little FET in there on the voltage input pins that just pulls to ground if it thinks that a given cell needs to be balanced. What do we mean by balanced? By balanced, we mean hooking up a resistor across the cell as it's being charged to divert some of the current away from that cell. So in this case, if this cell is, is measured too high, we'd go ahead and turn on this FET, which would turn on this PFET here, which would enable current to flow through this 40 ohm resistor around that cell as we're charging. There's an even simpler approach that's used in some of our protectors. Simple voltage-based balancing. It just simply operates on a, with a comparator that senses when uh, any cell is too high. When any cell is too high, we turn off the charger and we don't resume it again until that high cell comes down to a, a safe level. So you start to get this pattern where they all start to come together. Now that doesn't really require any, any firmware in that case. Many of the monitors have cell balancing FETs already built into them. So they actually can do the balancing without any uh, e external 
I have, see, I have really big fingers. <laughs> they can do it without uh, any external fats. If I can get back, there we go, okay. But what if this isn't enough? Here, we, here we're showing a 1K, typically it's a 100 ohm resistor, is about all the current we wanna pull through that little fat that's inside the IC. If we wanna boost this, it's pretty easy to do. Right, we just add another, add another fat in there and another resistor. So now when this fat turns on, it causes a drop across this 1K resistor, which turns on that P-channel fat and now current is flowing through this much stiffer resistance to, to give a higher current to our active balancing. Charging support is another function of a good battery monitor. It can inform the charger what's the recommended charging current, the charging voltage. It can conform to the JADA as it's doing that. It can reduce charge time by recommending the, you know, the best scenario. It can extend battery life by avoiding overcharging. And of course, pre-charging, where you're depleted, uh, you, you, know, you want to use a, a much lower current. So the typical battery monitor can also master the communication bus and actively tell the host that something, something's wrong with the charging or that this is the, the newly recommended charging current or voltage. Communication and display, the, a good monitoring uh, system will, will talk to the host, SM bus, I squared C, HDQ, there are a few others, and will communicate visually if necessary with LEDs. One, two, three, four, five LEDs uh, indicating the state of charge. And the LEDs can also indicate error conditions with certain kind of flashing codes sometimes. Logging. Logging works like an airplane black box recorder. Right? I think of it as kind of a peak detector. Every time there's a new higher voltage, a higher current, a higher temperature, it records that. So you can look back through all these numbers and see, see what, what kind of environment you had in, the, in a pack that may have failed and come back to the factory. You also get other things like reset counts, uh, cycle counts and you can look for excessive flash wear. Okay, that's section one. Section two, we're gonna dive down. This is a deep dive. We're gonna deep dive down into fuel gauging a little bit, which is by far the hardest part of this to understand if you're new. Okay, vocabulary. You have to know the meaning of these terms, otherwise you're just gonna get, you're gonna get lost right from the start. And uh, I, didn't, I didn't take the space to define them for you here, so you can't use this as a reference, but I think th these are the critical things you need to know. We group them in terms of capacity, voltage, and current, okay? And the capacity ones, there's kind of two types. There's the milliamp hour parameters, and then there's the percent, percent of full charge. Milliamp hours are, are probably the most interesting. We have Design capacity, that's the, that's the number that may be printed right on the battery. 2,600 milliamp hours, right? What that means is that's the capacity that you can get if you discharge this thing at that current for one hour, okay? Next is Qmax, that's the chemical capacity. capacity. That's the number of milliamp hours you can get if there's, well, well actually, theoretically, no load but maybe you have a few milliamps and you can expect to get quite a bit higher capacity than at one amp. FCC, full charge capacity, also called usable capacity, that's the capacity that you're going to get at your load, okay? Remaining capacity, that's what's left at any given point as you're discharging or charging. 
Now we get to these percent, R SOC, that's the relative state of charge. That's the percent of, of charge remaining. DOD uh, is more the, uh, uh, I guess R SOC is, is related to what's the percent left at your load. And DOD is related to what's already been consumed at no load. Was that right, Yefkin? Excellent, okay. So sometimes it's confusing because we talk in terms of uh, state of charge or relative state of charge, which starts at 100% when you're fully charged. And other times we talk in terms of, you know, sort of a one minus that, a DOD, depth of discharge, which is zero when you're fully charged and 100% when you're discharged. So you've got, to be, you've got to be flexible and able to go back and forth between those two ways of looking at, at similar things. DOD zero, DOD one, as, as we're going to see in about four slides or so, we've got to take a couple of measurements when, when the cells are relaxed in order to figure out the total capacity. And, when we, and we, we number those, we might call them DOD zero, DOD one, or DOD one and DOD two, but you've got to take these two measurements that we use as a basis for knowing the full capacity. And we'll, we'll see that in more detail in a few minutes. All right. Voltages, OCV, that's the open circuit voltage. Could be anywhere along that curve. OCV at DOD, that refers to our lookup table, right? It just means if you look up a DOD in our table, we'll give you back an OCV. We also use the reverse of that function. EDV, end of discharge voltage. Okay, that, that refers to a voltage where down near the end of the discharge, generically. Okay, EDV2 usually refers to uh, the voltage where we learn in a CEDV, non impedance track type of gauge. It's sort of a learning point that represents typically 7% remaining state of charge. A good place to learn the capacity because you still have something left, and then we have a nice slope on the curve. EDV zero is the place is the voltage where your system is defined to actually crash. CEDV stands for compensated end of discharge voltage, and we'll drill into this in a few minutes. This is a a model that we use to calculate uh, calculate the end of discharge voltage that represents 7% or 3% or 0%. All right, currents, we have a couple of terms there. C rate, if you're not familiar with batteries, they call current rate. <laughs> they call current rate, that's all. All you need to know. Uh, Coulomb counting, again, is just integrating the current over time so we know the charge, keep track of the charge in the cells. So how do we figure out how much capacity is actually available? We've got this open circuit voltage curve, which is useful, educational, and we can see that if we had almost no load or no load, you could really, really get over more than five ampere hours out of this cell. It's voltage as opposed to capacity. The problem is when you add a, add a, add a load, we get a voltage drop across the impedance in the cell. So now we have a usable capacity that is actually less than five ampere hours here. Because this is where you're gonna cross the three volt into discharge voltage earlier. So you can see as this blue line moves up and down with applied load, you're gonna have a smaller and smaller usable capacity. So what does a fuel gauge do? Suppose we are here and we want to figure out which route the battery is taking. Right? It could go any number of different ways. We want to know what is the capacity at the current load, what is the state of charge, and how long can the battery run? 
So in current integration based fuel gauging, it's pretty simple, the formula. We've, we've learned the FCC either in produ mass produ during mass production or sometime in the field, and we know that we have this amount. We've counted from fully charged, we've counted the coulombs down to where we are, okay? So what's remaining? Well, very simply, just the difference between the full and what, what we've used so far. Not much to it, right? State of charge, which again is a percent of full charge, is just the remaining state of charge divided by the full state of charge. So there's a real simple way to make a, a, a Coulomb counting gas gauge, and that's to use the fixed into discharge voltages. You could kind of take some measurements with your load and see, well, what is the voltage when I have 7% left? Okay, and we call that EDV2. Plug that into your firmware. Maybe make another one for 3% so you have a real nice warning that this thing is about to run out. We call that EDV1. And then zero, EDV0 again is defined as where your system crashes. And of course, if you want to leave some reserve in there, fine. So these are fixed voltages and the gauge, the monitor, can, can start to look for these voltages and could actually correct for a Coulomb counter that has gone astray, either because of self-discharge or uh, offsets in the Coulomb counting circuit. So as you start to discharge, you, your Coulomb counter may have developed some inaccuracies. It might think that you have 8% left, but then when it hits this voltage, it can say, aha, we know that this voltage means seven, so we do a correction. And that's called learning, FCC, down at, down at the bottom. Problem is, remember this line goes up and down with the applied load. So you've got to be very conservative when you plug in these numbers. Not to plug in one that's going to get you in trouble if you happen to have a transient it forces your voltage to dip down momentarily. All right, so how can we fix that? We have a model, a, a black, let's call it a black box called CEDV. What it is, is a formula that calculates a voltage based upon the current state of charge, the current and the temperature. So you kind of got this black box with three inputs and one output, right? Um, using this model, these EDV voltages will move up and down depending upon the conditions. So now I'm going to dive into this and show you a few details. Now, in, in order not to confuse you, this is a graph where it, we're showing the reverse process. This is not actually a charge curve, this is actually a discharge curve going from right to left at a very cold temperature, okay? All right, so here's the actual voltage curve of the battery. And we're gonna try to figure that out based on this model. So we start with this OCV curve that we defined in the model by two of these magic seven numbers that, that make up our, our model, called EMF and C0. And then we're gonna measure the current and that run that through some of these other numbers in there, R0, R1, and T0, to correct this curve for resistance and temperature. And then we're gonna take another uh, factor called TC and correct it for low temperature. Low temperature has some special considerations associated with it. So now we've got a predicted curve that very closely, the gold one down there, that very closely represent, matches up with a, with a red one. There's a reserve capacity that can be used uh, to shift the curve around if we want to add some reserve. 
at the bottom. So these are sort of the magic seven numbers of CEDV that you need to come up with for every project. And here's the actual formula um, where it's actually calculating a voltage depending on the open circuit voltage, the IR drop, um, sorry. I'm sure you're writing this down. <laughs> anyway, it's just a voltage calculated by the IR drops based, you know, corrected for temperature, state of charge, age, etc. I guess what I'm trying to say is that even if you're trying to build a gauge on, based on your own microcontroller, even if you're trying to use a relatively simple technique, it's, it's still difficult. So that, ga that kind of gauge works very well as long as your use model lets you discharge down to 7% occasionally. If you're like me, the notebook sits on a table. Once in a while, I, I, I use my battery which I call a UPS for my low, you know, notebook, and I'll take it somewhere for a few minutes, and then I'll bring it back and put the charger back on. My battery will never get down to 7%, so it doesn't work too good for me. But most people do, once in a while, and it only, probably only a few times a year is enough. Get it down to 7%, right? It might even be in the manual of your computer. Discharge it deep, deeply once in a while. But if you can't do that, and many other applications, you simply cannot. <clears throat> Impedance track fuel gauging is, is a much better way to go. Also has some other advantages. Um, we can do state of charge updates whenever the cells are relaxed. So self-discharge is no longer a guess. Self-discharge becomes something we measure and correct for. We can learn the impedance. We, do, we don't have to model what this impedance is going to be doing over the lifetime. We actually measure it every time we have a, a, a valid discharge. OK, so to understand the impedance track algorithm, first you need to understand the three states. Um, man, you could re reduce it to two states, really. Uh, you need to understand that it, there's, there's a, a state when we're charging or discharging and a state where we're not, where we're relaxed, okay? So here we see a graph of current, and we have zero current along this middle line here. Now we define discharging as any negative current and charging as positive current, okay? So here we see a charge mode. The charge current is, is getting less and less and less and less, and suddenly it hits this threshold called quit current, okay? And then a timer starts. And when that timer times out, if we're still under quit current, now we've changed state and we say, ah, we're relaxed. And then we go into a uh, discharge down here and then coming back out of that, it's the same thing. When the current gets very, very small, we trigger a timer. When a timer times out, we go back into relaxation. So we can go, kind of go back and forth. Typically, you will. You'll charge up all the way, and then when the charger turns off, you're relaxing. You may take your machine, your notebook, whatever, and use it for a while, and then turn it off. Or your cell phone goes into uh, standby, and you start to relax. Okay. So, here's the 10,000 foot view of impedance track. Five things. First of all, we have a chemistry table in data flash, where the open circuit voltage is a function of the depth of discharge. And this is a beautiful thing about lithium and I guess all chemistries, is that this thing stays constant over the life of the cells. And of course, it's very useful to be able to use the reverse of that, to be able to look up a DOD, 
based upon a voltage too. Okay, number two, we learn the impedance during discharge. I think of this as a voltage source and impedance is defined as DVDI, right? Well, how do we get DVDI? Well, DV is the voltage you've got right now under load. Subtracted from it would be what it would be if you had no load. And DI is just the current at the moment or the average current recently because that's because this was taken at zero milliamps. So it is in fact DVDI. We, this is number three is the major trick I think in, in impedance track. We update the max chemical capacity, the Qmax for each cell based on this kind of formula. And we'll look at this graphically in a few slides. But remember I said you need to take two measurements of state of charge based on voltage in order to learn Qmax. So for example, if, if we'd taken one here, SO1, at, and we looked it up in our table, and we found that we were at 80% state of charge, okay? And then later when we relaxed, we took another one and we found that we were at 30% state of charge, okay? And we counted the coulombs between those two and we found that there were 1,000 milliamp hours. All right, so we take the 1,000 milliamp hours divided by 80% minus 30%, which is 50%, or 0.5, okay? So 1,000 divided by 0.5 is 2,000. So the full chemical capacity is then sort of ratiometrically calculated to be 2,000 milliamp hours. Number four, temperature modeling. We know the temperature now. We might have tracked the history of the temperature, but what is it going to be from now on? It's really important because the impedance is moving all over the place with, the temp with temperature. So we need some kind of model in there to, to know, to, to, to predict from the way things have been going, what will it be at end of discharge? And number five, we need to run a periodic simulation to calculate what the remaining capacity will be and the full capacity. Simulation is a firmware loop that calculates capacity as it heads down towards a, into discharge voltage. So back to the open circuit voltage curve again. This can be really helpful to know that within a given chemistry, these are all the same. We have hundreds of them in our library. But if, for example, you needed to have a second source for your battery or you needed to replace batteries in the field with a slightly different type, as long as you can identify that they're the exact same chemical formula, then you don't have to go in and update this, this database in your monitor. Resistance updates. This is, a, this is a picture of how the resistances all on four different cells looked before we started updating them. Uh, this bottom line. And then suddenly we get a resistance update and what happens is every cell gets updated separately and it all gets sort of uh, scaled. So every time you, you read a resistance value at one step, say at 50% state of charge, and we find that it's 7% higher than it was last time, well, we, just, we can just go ahead and, and raise all the points in the array by 7%. Yeah, we use 15 values in that record for recording res resistances. This represents the entire state of charge from 100% from down to zero. They're about 11% apart. So, you know, the first one you get is down there at 89% and then 78, something like that, until you start getting down towards the end of the curve and then they start to get much closer together. 
But we've got 15 values in there, and of course, we can interp interpolate this table. If you're at 57% capacity and you want to know the resistance, we just interpolate between the two closest resistance values that we know about, and we can get a real, real good value for resistance. Okay, so here's that picture of how we get the QMAX update. What we're looking at here is a discharge and a relax, and then a charge and a relax. So this is what we call updating on the charge. We had a nice, nice relaxation here, and we took a measurement, we took a voltage measurement there, and we looked up the state of charge in our table. And then we had a charge happen. And then, and then it stopped, and then we had a relaxation. Ah, relaxed enough to where we could make another measurement. Now for these kind of measurements, the voltage has to be really relaxed. I think it's four microvolts per minute. Is that, is that correct? Yeah. Per second. Four, I'm sorry. Four microvolts per second. That's how, that's how relaxed we want these cells to be before we go to our, our database and look up the corresponding state of charge for this voltage. Here's another example on the bottom. This is what we call learning on, on discharge. Same sort of thing. We discharge, we relax, we discharge again where we're counting the coulombs, and then we relax, and we do another OCV lookup. And based upon that, that uh, formula there, very simply, we calculate the full Qmax of this battery, of, the, of each cell. SCC learning. Um, this is something that comes out of the simulation, which I'll talk a little bit about in a minute. FCC has changed as you move from a CEDV gauge where you only learn FCC when you discharge the 7%. Suddenly, with impedance track technology, we're able to learn it all the time. So it can go up and down. People aren't used to seeing that if you've just moved to impedance track te technology. Some people don't like it. They don't, want to, they don't want to see the full charge capacity changing during a discharge. But that's reality. That's what happens. If your load changes, your FCC changes. Again, we need to model temperature of this battery. And we put this into the impedance track algorithm so that we can predict where the temperature is going to go as we continue on down towards the end of discharge. Uh, here's a graphic concept of the simulation that's run. I think we do this every time we cross one of those resistance grid points. And basically, it's, it's a firmware loop that says, what if, what if capacity was 4% less than it is now? What would our voltage be? And it keeps spinning through that loop until it finds a voltage that represents end of discharge. And then it basically counts up and interpolates how many times it went through that loop. And by doing that, you know the remaining state of charge. And you can calculate the full the full uh, FCC from that. We've done a lot of testing with this algorithm over the years, and it's really, really very good, the results. You don't really care about accuracy when, you're, when, you're get, when your battery's full, do you, or even at half. But when you start to get down to 10%, 5%, 3%, that's when it becomes critical. So we did a lot of testing, and we can see that at 10%, 5%, 3%, actually improves. Uh, the red line is at 10%, and these, these are deviations from perfect here in terms of percent error. It, act, it actually starts to improve as you get down toward the end of discharge.
So in summary, if we compare those two types of gas gauging algorithms, um, the red here is, is, is meant to be a, a con, a, and the green is meant to be a pro, if you will. Worst error um, on a new learned pack, 1% for impedance track, better than 2% for CDV. Well, but here's a big one, worst error for a learned, aged battery. You actually can get as bad with a very, very old battery as 30% where you're not learning the impedance throughout the life of the cells. Impedance track, you can stay within 2%. Uh, data collection, this has to do with the effort that you have to put forth for every project to, to get all the parameters set right to make this work. It's a one-time thing, but it is significantly more with CDV because you've got to do all this fitting to get, to get those seven magic numbers. Um, you can run an optimization cycle for impedance track within a week. Instruction flash, CDV is much more compact. So that's a disadvantage of the, of the Z-Track. Voltage accuracy. As a minimum, you need three millivolts accuracy on your voltmeter. That's where, you know, I, I'm not standing up here to sell anything, but that's where a, a, a data acquisition system on a chip like we have with, with that kind of a voltmeter, that kind of a current meter, that kind of temperature meter for just a few bucks. I mean, even if we didn't have the, all this fancy firmware, that, that chip would be worth, to me, would be worth the price just as if you wanted to make a meters out of them. Not so critical with, with CDV. Voltage is not that big of a deal. Current is important. State of charge initialization, can't do it. If you're right, if you're right in the middle of a, you don't know where you are with CEDV, you can't just do a power on reset and know where you are. Impedance track, yes. Anywhere you are on a relaxed cell, we can just make a voltage measurement and figure out where we are. FCC, temperature compensation. There are rare exceptions, but generally with CEDV gauges, we don't have that that we do with impedance track. Same with rate compensation. This, this to me is a big one. If, you, if, if you're going to be producing these things in mass, um, typically for CEDV, you want something called a learning machine for every pack that you ship. So you want to charge it up, discharge it, and maybe bring it back to the middle before you ship. Now, if you're shipping hundreds, thousands, millions of packs, that's a lot of capital equipment. With impedance track, you don't need to do that. You optimize one pack, store it as a golden image, and then you just plug that into every pack. So I'm starting to sound like a salesman, not an engineer, sorry. Thank you. Any questions? Wow. Oh, yes. How do we determine the zero of what? The zero state of charge. How do we determine it? In, in terms of when you are optimizing your cell in your, in your lab as you're, as you're evaluating, it's a voltage. Right? It's the voltage where your system crashes. Now you might want to put a little room in there between what you say that is and where it really crashes, but that's the definition. To me, the cell phone is the toughest of all possibilities, right? Because your transmitting power is a function of the distance from the tower. Now, how do you know, how does your gas gauge know where you're going to be? You might go park under a cell tower 
and your battery might last an hour. You might go five miles from that tower and your battery might last five minutes. Well, what if you're driving? <laughs> you know, it, that's where fuel gauging becomes smoke and mirrors, right? You, it, but if you know something about your load, you can do a much better job. Another one? Carlos, prefiero continuar en español. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. You, you indicated that FCC updates only during discharge, is that correct? Can FCC only updates during discharge, is that correct? True, that's quite true. FCC only updates during discharge. No. No, it'll come back. What causes it to come back? It'll come back when it runs a new simulation. It'll, and it runs simulations at these resistance grid points. Stop me if I'm wrong, Efkin, but and he might be able to elaborate on this. Well, the question was if we uh, FCC updates only during discharge. Do you plan on the Kimberlet version that you're using? Does it have many different devices? So the newer devices, FCC actually updates during the session as well as during charge, based on temperature change. For example, if temperature change is more than 3 to 5 kilowatt by 10 degrees C, it will recalculate. Is that correct? And also, it doesn't recalculate when you max the tank. So when you have taken these two points that I was talking about, and you will recalculate the max, then we won't update FCC. And that actually happens with the station. Okay. It's a good point. There are several versions of impedance track, and sometimes we call them IT1, IT2, IT3, and with each of these there have been these nice little improvements along the line and slightly different behavior. David?